We would like to give our profile of Nicholas Rorick with his slides. Let us sing the I Am Lord's Prayer on page 22 of the Hard Headed Hand booklet, number 27. Please offer your invocations. Welcome to take notes. Nicholas Konstantinovich Rorik was born in St. Petersburg on October 9, 1874. This slide shows Nicholas Rorik as a young man. The name Nicholas means one who overcomes, and Rorik means rich in glory. Nicholas Rorik was the firstborn son of Constantine and Maria Rorik. His father was a prominent attorney and notary, and Nicholas spent much of his youth at the family's large country estate called Ishvara, located about 55 miles southwest of St. Petersburg. There, in the beauty of northern Russia, a lifelong love for nature was kindled in young Nicholas. At Ishvara, he developed a passion for hunting and an avid interest in natural history, archaeology, and the history of Russia. He was fond of music, and horseback riding was one of his favorite sports. As a teenager, Nicholas wrote and illustrated adventure stories about hunting. He also wrote poems, stories, and plays on themes from Russian history. Some of his hunting stories were published by hunting magazines. A friend of his father, who was an artist, recognized Nicholas' artistic talent and gave him his first art lesson. Nicholas' favorite motto was, forward without looking back. Forward without looking back. In 1893, when it came time for Nicholas to go to the university, his father wanted him to study law, but Nicholas wanted to pursue art. The situation was resolved by Nicholas enrolling simultaneously in both the law faculty of the Imperial University as well as the Imperial Academy of Arts. 
In the closing months of his schooling at the Academy of Arts, Nicholas planned out a series of 12 paintings on the founding of the Russian nation. The first of these was the painting he submitted as his graduation project entitled The Messenger, Tribe Has Risen Against Tribe. Author Jacqueline Dechter describes this painting in her book, Nicholas Rourke, The Life and Art of a Russian Master. She says it depicts an old messenger sitting in a wooden boat. His stooped back and lowered arms conveyed sadness and concern. He is bearing news to a neighboring settlement that the tribes are at war. It is night and all is quiet. The young moon illuminates the white shirts of the messenger and the oarsman who is standing as he rows up the river. In the distance, the outline of a Slavic settlement nestled in the hills is barely visible in the darkness. The mood of anxiety and mysteriousness suffuses the painting. The Messenger was lauded by both art critics and collectors and was purchased by a renowned patron of the arts for his private collection in Moscow. After this prestigious recognition, Rorick's work attracted the attention of the art world. Rorick had occasion to show his painting of the messenger to Leo Tolstoy. Tolstoy liked it and derived a parable from it. His comment was, have you ever crossed a rapidly flowing river in a boat? It is always necessary to steer higher than the spot toward which you are headed. Otherwise, you would be taken downstream. So too, in the sphere of moral demands, it is always necessary to steer higher Life takes everything downstream. Let your messenger hold the helm high, then he'll reach his destination. In 1898, with his formal education concluded, Nicholas became assistant director of the Museum of the Society for the Encouragement of Fine Arts. In September 1900, Nicholas went to Paris to study art. In the summer of 1901, he returned to St. Petersburg, where he married Helena Ivanovna Shaposhnikova in October of that year. Nicholas and Helena had two sons, George and Svetoslav. Helena was an accomplished pianist. This is a painting of Helena Rorik by her son Svetoslav. She came to be regarded as a distinguished lady of letters and a prolific writer in the esoteric tradition of Eastern religion. In 1901, Nicholas won a prestigious appointment as secretary of the Society for the Encouragement of Fine Arts, where he proved to be a good administrator. In the early 1900s, the Roricks traveled extensively throughout Russia and Europe. During these journeys, Professor Rorick painted, undertook archaeological excavations, studied architecture, lectured, and wrote about art and archaeology. In 1906, he was promoted from secretary to director of the School of the Society for the Encouragement of Fine Arts. After 1907, he began applying his talents to stage and costume design, and later designed sets for Diaghilev, the famous Russian ballet impresario and for Stravinsky's ballet, The Rite of Spring. In 1918, the Rorik family left Russia for Finland shortly before the border between Finland and the Soviet Union was permanently closed. Jacqueline Dechter notes that opinions differ about Rorik's reaction to the Russian Revolution, that is, to the Bolshevik Revolution. The Western scholars claim that he stayed in Finland to escape the new political system Soviet biographers, on the other hand, maintain that he embraced the revolution even though he was aloof from politics and naively utopian in his belief that the arts lay outside the political sphere. He did, in fact, advocate a more progressive society that would eradicate the blatant injustices of the time, and he was convinced of the irreversibility of the revolutionary movement. But in the interest of his beliefs, he sided neither with the revolutionaries nor with those who yearned for a return to the old order. There are some fundamentalist Christians in the United States today who affirm that Nicholas Rorick was a communist. We find no such evidence. At the invitation of the director of the Chicago Art Institute, Rorick came to the United States in 1920. 
He traveled widely, exhibited his works, lectured at exclusive girls' schools and even at Marshall Field's department store in Chicago, where he taught on the spiritual garment and the harmonizing of the human aura with clothing. While in the United States, Rorick founded the Master Institute of United Arts, an international society of artists called Core Ardens, which means flaming heart, and an international art center in New York called Corona Mundi, which means crown of the world. As a tribute to Rorick, the Rorick Museum was established in New York in 1923. Rorick's work contains scenes of nature, themes inspired by history, architecture, and religion. Here is an example of nature, Kachinjunga. Then we see Leh, Ladakh, an example of architecture. And then Our Lady of Talashkino. This is an example of religious art. He was influenced by a great many artists and a variety of schools of art, but his was a school of his own making. This slide shows the messenger. Rorick's paintings are mystical, allegorical, epic, sublime, and even prophetic. The next slide shows the last angel, an earlier work. Rorick's artistic style is difficult to describe because as architect Claude Bragdon put it, he belongs to an elect fraternity of artists, including da Vinci, Rembrandt, Blake, and in music, Beethoven, whose works have a unique, profound, and indeed a mystical quality which differentiates them from their contemporaries making it impossible to classify them in any known category or to ally them with any school. Because they resemble themselves only and one another like some spaceless and timeless order of initiates. Both Nicholas and Helena had an interest in Eastern philosophy, religion, and culture. Dechter writes, the inclusion of both Western and Eastern deities, saints, and sages in his paintings indicates Rorick's deep-seated belief in the fundamental unity of spiritual teaching. This slide shows Lao Tzu, part of the banners of the East series. The next one is Quan Yin, the patron saint of sailors. And the next one is the mother of the world. To Rorik, the most universal of all the great teachers, the very symbol of spiritual and cultural unity, is the mother of the world. And he painted this subject many times throughout his career. As Rorik himself expressed it, to both East and West, the image of the great mother, womanhood, is the bridge of ultimate unification. And Nicholas Rorick had desired for a long time to travel to the East in order to study the ancient culture firsthand. In 1925, he started on his first expedition. The expedition included Nicholas, Helena, their son George, and several other Europeans. Their son Svetoslav later joined them for a leg of the journey. Rorick wrote of his goals. Of course, as an artist, my main aspiration in Asia was towards artistic work. In addition to its artistic aims, our expedition planned to study the position of the ancient monuments of Central Asia, to observe the present condition of religions and creeds, and to note the traces of the great migrations of nations. This arduous and often dangerous trek took more than three years, and Rorick's party traveled 15,500 miles through Central Asia. Despite overwhelming obstacles, Rorick, a prolific painter, executed hundreds of paintings during the journey. Dechter writes, while in Sikkim, Rorick painted a series of works entitled His Country, which was inspired as much by the physical grandeur of the Himalayas as by the spiritual mysteries harbored within them. 
Indeed, for the artist, these towering peaks represented the very summit of beauty and spirituality. Rurik said, all teachers journeyed to the mountains. The higher knowledge, the most inspired songs, the most superb sounds and colors are created on the mountains. On the highest mountains, there is the supreme. The high mountains stand as witnesses of the great reality. From his country series, we see the pearl of searching. And he who hastens. It was during Rorik's Central Asian expedition that he discovered legends and texts recounting the journey Jesus took to the East during his so-called lost years between the ages of 12 and 30. The same or similar manuscripts were also found by Russian journalist Nicholas Notovich and Swami Abedananda at Himis Monastery in Ladakh. I have published all three of their translations of this text in my book, The Lost Years of Jesus, along with a story of Dr. Elizabeth Kaspari, who was also told while visiting the Himis Monastery at Ladakh that the manuscripts about Jesus' sojourn in the East were housed there. A monk appeared on the rooftop holding these texts and extending them to Mother Gloria and to Dr. Kaspari, and he said with great joy, these books say your Jesus was here. My work on the lost years of Jesus includes 16 color plates of Rorik's magnificent paintings. At the conclusion of the expedition in 1928, the Roricks permanently settled in the Kulu Valley in India. Here they founded the Urusvati Himalayan Research Institute. Here are examples of works painted in Kulu. The first one is Maitreya. Then we have Star of the Hero. Treasure of the Mountain. Spring in Kulu. Krishna is playing his flute under the tree. George Rorick was the head of the Ethnological, Linguistic, and Archaeological Departments, and Svetislav ran the Departments of Ancient Asian Art and Botanics. In 1934 and 35, the United States Department of Agriculture sponsored another Rorick expedition to Asia that lasted 17 months. Its primary purpose was to find drought-resistant grasses to alleviate the drought conditions in the United States at that time. Preserving the world's cultural heritage was a lifelong dedication of Rorik that came to fruition in 1935 with the signing of the Rorik Pact Treaty at the White House by representatives of the countries comprising the Pan American Union. Under the pact, nations were obliged to respect museums universities, cathedrals, and libraries as they did hospitals. Just as hospitals flew the Red Cross flag in time of war, cultural institutions would fly Rorick's Banner of Peace, a flag that has a white field with three red spheres in the center surrounded by a red circle. By protecting culture, Rorick believed the spiritual health of the nations would be preserved. Rorick was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1929 and 1935 and for his efforts to promote international peace through art and culture and to protect art treasures in time of war. World War II interrupted his activities and those of the Urusvati Himalayan Research Institute and Rorik devoted himself to helping victims of the war. He also donated money from the sale of his paintings and books to the Soviet Red Cross. In the summer of 1947, Rorik had heart surgery but was soon back at his easel. One of the last paintings by Rorick is called The Master's Command. It depicts a white eagle flying toward a devotee who is meditating in the lotus posture atop a high cliff overlooking a mountain valley. 
on December 13, 1947, while Rorick was working on a variant of this picture, his heart suddenly failed and his soul took flight to higher octaves. He was 73 years old. This is a portrait of Rorick by Svetislav. All his life, Nicholas Rorick found the time to be involved in a multitude of activities and to do them all very well. Vladimir Shibayev, who was the secretary at the Himalayan Research Institute for a decade, wrote that he never saw Rorik idle, inactive, scattered, or fussy. Svetoslav Rorik wrote that his father was kind and patient, never wasting even a moment of his time, perfectly balanced in stress and felicity, always helpful and always mindful of the welfare of his associates. Zina Fosdick, a longtime associate of the Roricks, said of Nicholas, his was the wisdom of both the earthly and supermundane planes, ever compassionate, alleviating heartaches of those who came to him. He never belittled but only magnified, finding in ever so small a consciousness a seed of good. Rorik's life was truly patterned after the bodhisattva ideal, compassion, courage, constancy, of striving and the development of energy or virya. Dector writes of Rorik's spiritual life. Eastern culture, philosophy, and religious teachings held an even greater appeal for both Nicholas and Helena Rorik. The writings of Ramakrishna and his disciple Vivekananda left a deep and lasting impression on them, particularly the idea that devotion to God was accomplished through activity useful to society, through every person's fulfillment of his duty and obligations, and that this devotion in turn facilitated the perfection of the individual. Ramakrishna preached the necessity of spiritual perfection, which could be attained through the enlightenment of individuals by schooling man in goodness, justice, and altruism. It is likely that Rorik's paintings illustrating the good works of saints were inspired by these concepts. His written work of this period includes allusions to the quotes and quotes from Tagore, Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, and the Bhagavad Gita. Theosophy, a spiritual doctrine developed by Helena P. Blavatsky in the 1870s, also appealed to the Rorik's. A Russian branch of the Theosophical Society was founded in 1908, and the Rorik's apparently joined it prior to World War I. Years later, Helena Rorik translated Blavatsky's monumental work, The Secret Doctrine, into Russian. Rorik was not an adherent of any one established religion or philosophical movement. His own deeply spiritual philosophy incorporated elements of Buddhism, Hinduism, pantheism, theosophy, Russian orthodoxy, and even the theory of relativity. He also embraced the ancient teachings of Agni Yoga, or the yoga of fire, a yoga of action rather than asceticism. In 1920, the Rorik's formed the first groups devoted to the study of Agni Yoga. Of Rorik's prolific career, Dector writes, Nicholas Rorik's legacy extends to four continents. It comprises some 7,000 paintings, drawings, and set and costume designs, nearly 30 books, countless articles and lectures, museums and societies throughout the world, and the Rorik Pact all along the path that took him from the messenger to the master's command, from St. Petersburg to the Kulu Valley, he follows Tolstoy's advice and held the helm high to reach his destination. Svetislav Rorik once wrote of his father, he was a great patriot and he loved his motherland, yet he belonged to the entire world, and the whole world was his field of activity. Every race of men was to him a brotherly race, every country a place of special interest and of special significance. Every religion was a path to the ultimate, and to him life meant the great gates leading into the future. Every effort of his was directed towards the realization of the beautiful, and his thoughts found a masterful embodiment in his paintings, writings, and public life. No one has ever portrayed mountains like my father. 
From his canvases, the Himalayas radiate upon us all their unbelievable wealth of color, beauty, and the inexpressible majesty of the great concept for which the very word Himalaya stands. Truly, he earned the name given to him, the master of the mountains. Through all his paintings and writings runs the continuous thread of a great message, the message of the teacher calling to the disciples to awaken and strive towards a new life, a better life, a life of beauty and fulfillment. That is the end of the quote from Svetislav Rorik and the end of my profile. This is the book by Jacqueline Dechter on Nicholas Rorick. In preparation for the dictation, we are going to have our slide meditation with Rorick's paintings.
When you think of me, my friends, compatriots and co-workers, think then of the sacred fire. Think on me in the Agni Yoga. I am grateful to address you today, to speak to you from the plane of the Ascended Masters, that you might know that one from among you has graduated to this level and that you might accomplish the same. Never tire then in the work that is your Dharma, your duty to be the wholeness of yourself. Never be frustrated that you are misunderstood or before your time in your understanding of the stars, the universes, the mountains, and the petals of a flower. I have indeed fought the good fight, and I have won. Yet I still pursue the crown, for, beloved, every level has its goal and goal-fitting. And now we speak of the goal-fittedness of the chilas of El Moria. Now I speak of the one, my beloved, my Helena, who remains to keep the flame for me in earth as I deliver from above through her heart even the completion of our mission. Embrace then the work that is yours, and if you have lost the hours in not perfecting that work, O children of the sun, then go back to school, find the best teacher in your field, but work to perfect your art, your science, your calling, Work, my beloved, for the night is far spent of the old order and of the old karma, and the day of Aquarius dawns, truly the day and the hour of your manifestation of Maitreya and of the mother of the world. Feel very close to me in this moment, for I have made myself present just above the physical octave, desiring to endue you and all who are responsive to the cord of my life with a greater light, a greater fire, a greater determination. As you have been told, things are not what they seem in the world today. In some areas, conditions are worse than they seem, and in some areas, they are better. May you know the difference, beloved, to take the fire from the heart of the mountain, from the heart of the Arhat, to pierce illusion, to pierce Maya, and to enter in at the straight gate to the heart of your own Christhood. O oh, my beloved, the great gift of the violet flame is also mine to impart to you. Let my students receive it, for it is indeed the means for the acceleration of the ascension process. It is Agni. It is the fire of the greatest yogis. And at no hour in the history of Earth has its use been more necessary to daily consume the weight, the sheer weight of negative karma that weighs heavily upon the disciple, for the disciple raises up the light, and therefore the light becomes the vortex into which the darkness rushes, desiring transmutation. Therefore energy superimposed with darkness of mass hysteria does come tumbling into the vortex of light of every devotee. This is why, beloved, once you set your path to be that of Agni Yoga and to be that yogi or yogin, 
Know then you cannot cease, you must not cease. For the more fire that is intensified in your heart, the more you become that flaming cauldron into which there is poured the darkness, and you become the one who holds that vessel of world conflagration, world transmutation. I desire then to see my students everywhere in the world add to our teachings the practice of the science of the spoken word, most specifically the calling for the violet flame. I am that violet flame in action. Test me, beloved. See how I will commingle with your aura a violet flame, and therefore we shall be one through this intensity of the Lord's Spirit. The great masters who serve with Saint Germain have truly counseled with me that I might speak this day on the necessity of the use of this flame and its purifying action. Let it be well said, and let the word to the wise be sufficient, that I can help you, oh, so much more, on your path, if you will only take this gift from the great hierarch, the most blessed one, the Master Saint Germain. I am also grateful at the wide dissemination of our writings, most precious from the Brotherhood. I am grateful for this recent biography, if only for the reason that souls might be led through the art, through the life that I have lived. To the heart of Agni, thence to the heart of the Mother, thence to the heart of Maitreya. This city, then, has the negative spiral of the crumbling of the old order that is becoming more physical every day, as problems insurmountable reflect the problems of a nation as a whole. This brings sadness to the brothers in white and to their chilas, for an opportunity lost to draw souls into the perfect union of the three surely comes when civilization itself can no longer hold the matrix. Beloved ones, matter itself crumbles without the flame of Maitreya, without the flame of the World Mother. Therefore, walk the streets of this city and of your own cities from which you have journeyed to hear me speak. Walk the embodiment of Maitreya and the Mother, and recognize you anchor the light of far-off worlds, the light of cosmos and the cosmic Christ. I ask you, Chilas of the Ascended Masters, to include my name in your decrees and preambles as I work closely with El Moria, KH, and DK, and Lanello. I work closely for the bringing together of all those who are on the path of the sacred fire. There are many apart from our society, apart from Agni Yoga, who yet have that wavelength. Let them find union through the violet flame. Let them know that the seventh age has opened doors that were not open to me in previous incarnations. And I trust I myself have opened doors for truly this art that was inspired upon me by great adepts is the open door to the future and the sign and signal of Aquarius. It is liberating and it does draw the soul into realms beyond the physical octave. When you look at these paintings, the notion does not occur that these mountains do not appear in these colors, for the paintings themselves draw you to the etheric octave and bring to your soul the remembrance of your soul journeyings into the etheric octave. And thus, they are wholly natural to the eye, the inner eye of the soul. I have painted for the soul, beloved, for the liberation of the soul, for the quickening of the soul. 
I have painted so that the eyes of the soul might see independently and unhampered by the intellect of the mind. And I have brought the soul into proper proportion, as is the Asian tradition, against the backdrop of the immensity of nature. This has been my desire, and you can well see that I have developed this art in previous lifetimes, but I have also studied prior to this incarnation in the retreat of Paul the Venetian, the Lord of the Third Ray. I have studied in previous lifetimes, beloved, and truly this art has been my offering, not only to the Chilas, but to all of the world who cannot take the specific teaching, for it is too strong for them. Yet, in gazing upon my art, they might assimilate the truth embodied in the heart of the artist. And truly the artist is the great artist whose instrument I am, whose instrument you also can be, not necessarily as a painter, but in any field, for the great artist would work through you to bring before the people in whatever form or whatever service you may render the true patterns the heavenly patterns whereby the inner eye and the all-seeing eye converge, and the soul in gazing upon that innate perfection by your love, by whatever form that love does take, can be transported to higher realms instantaneously. May your very presence do this for those whom you meet. May many look upon you, beloved, and see there an open door, a window's view into heaven. O beloved, so many are in sorrow, in pessimism, and their souls are mourning, and therefore they don the garments of blackness, and they are burdened by the weight of world karma increasing. Oh, let the fire in the mountain of your being be the violet flame. Oh, no, beloved, how many souls receive surcease from pain and healing from your calls. I am rich in the spirit to bestow upon you the abundance of virtues, the abundance of all that you need to fulfill your mission. Only remember the first things first, Only remember the purification of the heart. Only remember the strengthening of the body itself. Certain masters of the brotherhood gather on this platform. They come, beloved, for by their presence seen at the level of your soul, you can establish a sense of co-equality with them, a sense of co-measurement as well that you might enter in and know that the path is hard, but it is not too hard for thee. Thou art chosen because thou hast chosen. Therefore know you are given the tests that you can pass, the strength with which to pass them. Leap into the fire, beloved, and emerge unscathed. Then you will understand the mystery of Agni. Blend into the flames and feel the mystical oneness with the lightning and the stars. Let your aura become the electric blue of the Divine Mother. Let your garments become the swaddling garment of a world. Many areas of the world find women and children, in hunger, in terror of the night, in fear of what is coming upon earth. You are so shielded in this nation that I am concerned lest that sudden destruction prophesied by the apostles should come upon you without your prior awareness. Such is the glory that yet remains of St. Germain's dispensation in the sponsoring of this nation. May you realize then that those things taking place 
in the Middle East do not augur well, neither for the body of light worldwide, nor for this nation, nor for the peoples involved. May you realize that great weights lie upon Mother Russia and upon her people, weights born since the Bolshevik Revolution. I state to you for now and for all time that I am for community and the community of the co-workers of light, but I am no part of the Bolshevik version of this concept, nor have I ever embraced the ideals of Lenin. I embrace the ideals of Christ and Buddha, and these ideals, beloved, lead to life, not death and therefore millions have died at the hand of this that has been called world communism. You recognize this, that death has followed in the wake of that revolution, much to the chagrin of all who have kept the flame of Mother Russia. May she rise again, and may it be in a new order of the ages. Yet I tell you, beloved, that which has beset that society bespeaks of coming calamity. Mark my words and prepare yourselves spiritually and see to it that you will keep the flame, that you will hold the candle in the night and not allow it to be extinguished. Do not allow the fire of the heart to go out for millions may one day depend upon you as a keeper of the flame. Thus it is the office of the Divine Mother to keep the flame, and may you know just how key is your role in this office and service. I was once admonished by one who taught me, one who was an original guru, that there is always an hour in the day that you can give to your art, to your prayer, to your call, to your industry. Why not 4 a.m.? What are you doing at 4 a.m.? Thus said to me this one, and so I mustered myself and perfected my art in the wee hours of the morning. When all is still, why not perfect your own sainthood, the corona of your life stream? Why not perfect the flowing of the light? There are things that cannot be put aside in life, for they burn from within. They are the calling, and that calling must be secured. Everything must be sacrificed for it and you must understand the inner and the outer calling. The outer calling cannot be successful, my beloved, without the inner calling being perfected. For the outer calling is to demonstrate to the world the effects of what the inner light complete can be. Choose your art well, perfect it well, for it is a requirement of the ascension that you fulfill your mission. Thus, remove yourself from the doodads of the world, from an encumbrance of things. Know the beauty of space and of emptiness that you might fill it with the Master's light. It is so, a beloved. It is so. One such as I came to embodiment to demonstrate a path of victory in a Western and an Eastern sense of the Bodhisattva ideal, to give of myself, to perfect the gift, and to move on where others also have need of me. May you know that this activity of the Ascended Masters is fitting for the goal of eternal life, many, many souls not even affiliated with it on the outer, yet who study the teachings and in their heart of hearts affirm the word, the I am. 
the Agni Yoga. Many souls are striving. Pray for them earnestly. The life of the spiritual guardian is surely a life of the divine art. Let your expression be one of the many hands of the Divine Mother, as the hands of Kuan Yin, even as the hands of Kali, of Shakti. The many hands of the Mother find expression through you, and I am in the Mother as the Mother is in my heart. This is the beauty of the life everlasting. The representative of the World Mother is in this room, a resplendent being of light. She has come to place just above your head, two inches, her crown, that you might feel the presence of that crown and make as your goal the winning of the crown of everlasting life. This crown is won by the overcomers. It is your assignment from my heart, for it comes from the heart of God, to be overcomers in the way, to overcome everything that is sent to you. And though the bowling balls keep rolling down the alley toward you, each one is overcome. This is what life expects of you and what you must expect of yourself in life to overcome all things coming your way 360 degrees of the circle of self. Then you see, overcoming darkness with light, you shall rise to levels where all that can be sent to you is light, light, light. And immediately you direct that light out again for the piercing of darkness around those who yet know not the way of the overcomers. Be ye overcomers, I say, and not be defeated, neither by the defeatist attitude or the negative spirals of anyone or anything. Insulate yourselves from negative media and the constant sounds and images of television that are so damaging to the finer bodies. Force the world to be silent in your home, in your abode where you commune with God. Shut it out, except when something is important to be let in. It is a world of noise. This noise affects the heart and the heart's attunement with the infinite. Seek the solace of quietude in nature and in the place you have prepared for your communion. For in the hour of your communion, beloved, the shaft of light from above to the below does manifest, and you begin to glow with light as you meditate and decree, and that glowing light, beloved, becomes an electrode in the earth and many souls receive strength refinement and nourishment from your effort. I am the Ascended Master, Nicholas Rorick. I am surely rich on the royal road of integration, and in my being there is light enough for all, and my angels, each bearing cups of light, Distribute my light daily to all devotees who are on a wavelength to receive it. Remember to call for my cup of light. I will give it you each day, beloved. As long as you are on the wavelength of the ascending one, the aspiring one, as long as you fear not to follow the mother of the world up the mountain, for she who leads you, beloved, is truly the one that long ago, sometime, somewhere, you have forsaken. This time, do not let go of her garments and let her lead you where she would take you. 
for she does indeed embody the will of the Father. Sometimes you will conclude that the way she has led you must be wrong, for look at the evidence. But beloved, she who leads sees the future and beyond. Therefore, cast thyself upon the breast of the mother and do know that in all of cosmos there is the dependency upon that one. And that one multiplies herself infinitely so that all may know that they walk and talk with the mother. Truly do adore that mother, beloved. Truly do raise up that mother within you. Truly greet her. Hail Mary. Hail Kuan Yin. Hail, O thou magnificent one of the ages. Hail, O our mother of the world. Into the arms of her presence and into her garments I recede. For in the heart of the mother is perfect communion and the entrance to samadhi and nirvana. By that entrance gained by Siddhartha, so Gautama entered the heights of the divine union with the mother and returned with that teaching that does abide with us forever. Therefore, in her name and in the name of Lord Gautama, I say, let us fling all inordinate desire into the fire, the agni. Let it be gone in the twinkling of an eye. It is not real, it has held no power over you. And I call to the five Dhyani Buddhas to neutralize the five poisons within you. But you must claim it yourselves. O oh, my beloved, the riches of the kingdom of God know no bounds. Yet the greatest riches are to be found in soul by soul by soul becoming that glowing light that shall never be extinguished. Be the unextinguishable ones, for then I shall be with you always. Let us take our ashram rituals. Do we have them today? Page 37, let us sing the prayer for my soul's awakening. I invite you to offer prayers to God and to the Ascended Master, Nicholas Rurik. Together.
so profoundly grateful for this dictation, for the fusion of our hearts with the Ascended Master Nicholas Rorick, and to truly feel his presence at this altar. I trust you will cherish and take with you forever this gift of communion in this hour. I would like to tell you that in determining the, the door fee for this event, I attempted to make the cost as low as possible based on a certain count of people being here. We haven't reached that certain count of people being here, and so I would like to invite you this time, at this time, only if you will, to contribute to our meeting to the full expenses of our being here. So we will have a love offering at this moment.
Beloved mighty I am presence from the heart of God, beloved ascended master Nicholas Rorick, beloved mother of the world, I ask for the blessing of this offering from each and every one of our hearts this night. I ask that it will be multiplied by the power of Almighty God and that it will go forth for the furtherment of art across this earth and for the victory of all souls of light, for the victory of this earth and of this city and of all good that is in this world. We ask for the sealing of each and every one of us who are gathered here and we ask that we will go forth with the fire and the agni in our hearts to ignite this world and to ignite all those light bearers throughout this earth who may not have the vision. We accept it on this hour in full power in accordance with God's will. In the name of the Father, the Mother, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. I would like to remind you that Summit University starts right after the new year at the Royal Teton Ranch at Maitri's Mystery School with levels one, two, and three. If you haven't been to Summit University and would like to be there, we would love to have you at that time. God bless you. I send you all my love as we are one, yet one, in the aura and radiance of the beloved master, Nicholas Rorick. The light is truly stupendous in this room at this time. Thank you.